Good morning. Man, uh, I am late. No question about it. Uh, I would have been one minute late, but my computer absolutely crashed as I was uh, putting things together for today's live stream. It feels like I just saw you guys like maybe 12 hours ago. And turns out it's pretty much that's exactly when I saw you last. I was on my uh, new uh, live stream. Uh, our nature of employment had a fascinating discussion last night about Amazon uh, and maybe negative things about Amazon. Uh, you should look to check into that if you get time. Again, the channel is our nature of employment. Um, it's totally different than the real estate channel. Um, the more I go on, the the more it'll diverge to something to something completely different. But I'm just talking about it now because it's literally brand new. Only had my second episode last night. It was a great one. It was a great one. Um, <clears throat> I don't know about tonight. I need to set up a Twitter account. I need to do about 16 other things today. Um, I've, I've got, I've just got things everywhere, uh, loose ends all over the place. Um, I'm not excited about that. I'm a little bit stressed, but you know what? Last night was a great, great live stream. The thing that would have made it better would be people in the chat, people actually watching it. So you know, hopefully we get to that point where we have uh, we have a big, big audience and can really, really let everyone, uh, you know, contribute and and just and just have a good time. That's that's the goal. It's like spending time with your friends on a Friday night. I guess last night, though, was a Saturday. Today is Sunday. It's the third of April. And um, based on what I see, it says it's the 35th consecutive live stream. I find that hard to believe. I think I miscounted somewhere along the way. I'm not proud of that. I just I haven't had a chance to go back and, and check uh, the, the actual numbers. But we're rolling along. We're rolling along. Do we have everything perfect? No, I, I don't think I did a podcast at all last week. Um, we have all kinds of things to do. Um, but you may be wondering, you know, we're two minutes in. You may be wondering, who is this person on my screen? Well, my name is John Schenk. And what does that have to do with you? Well, I don't know. I'm a, um, I'm a broker. I'm a real estate broker in St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, I, uh, I help people buy homes. And I help people sell homes. And then, you know, in the mornings, we, we run the live stream. And in the evenings, we run a different live stream about employment. But uh, that's what I do. Um, I've, had, I've been doing it for years. Um, the, the live stream thing has surprised me. Uh, I, I, I never really, social media and I never really got along. Um, taking a picture of myself in front of clients, uh, you know, a selfie, you know, say, hey, I'm working today seemed kind of dumb. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, that's what I do. Taking pictures of my sellers after they have sold their house. Well, I don't know that I need to take pictures then. And taking pictures of buyers after they bought a house also seems stupid. It seems like I'm exploiting my clients for my own gain. And I don't particularly like that. And so um, that's kind of where I'm at now. Do I, do I take pictures once in a while? Yes. But my point is simply, you know, social media isn't where I'm, I'm strongest. Um, now you may say, well, you're not very strong in the live stream either. Well, that was hurtful. That's all I have to say about that. Um, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it. I don't know how long I'll do it. I mean, the way it's going now, I think I could do it forever because there's never anybody on the stream. So it's like, eh, I mean, hopefully that'll change. I've made some changes. Um, and we're still a pretty young channel relative to, I mean, I like, in that 35 consecutive uh, shows, I think there's still some on the old Deerwood Realty channel. The old Deerwood Realty channel hasn't gone away. It's just where I do the podcasts and uh, it needs some work. I need to catch up, but I haven't been caught up because of what reason? Well, we're going into the busy season in real estate here in St. Louis. And when that happens, um, I have very little time to do much anything. And that's what we're seeing. While I can... You know, I can pull off a live stream. I can pull off two a podcast and showing houses and putting just office stuff together uh, is almost impossible. And so uh, that's where I'm at right now. It's just everything is in disarray. Um, if you called me and said, hey, will you help me buy a house? Yes, yes, but it's difficult right now. It's difficult. 
The market sucks for buyers. You say, well, that's not true. Yeah, okay. Okay. Good luck. Good luck. And you say, well, will you help me sell your house? Yes. Is it this week? Is it next week? Because I could really use, um, I could really use that. Is it six months from now? Yes. But we don't know what the market's going to be. Don't ask me what the price of your home is going to sell for now when uh, it's, when there's six months between now and then. That's just not going to happen. Also, I have no idea what your house will sell for. I can run the comps, okay? And I can have it set so like this is should be the asking price. But buyers and their agents are stupid and they just bid like stupid numbers over asking continually. So I don't know what the number is going to be. What I can do is I can help you. I can give you some ideas on what you need to do, what you need to pick up, what you need to fix, how you need to show the house. I mean, I see a lot of just basic errors. And I don't know if it's because like I, I suspect it's because here's how the uh, choosing of an agent works. Uh, it's almost like it's it's a pain, like an injury. It's like I need to sell my house. Uh, so and so is a friend of mine. Uh, they sold their house. Their agent must be decent. Let's bring that clown over and let's just do it. And I mean that makes it so that the person who has the most friends wins. Well, I'm a I'm an introvert. I I don't like to go out in public. I you don't see me very often. At all so I I lose that game. But I know an awful lot. And if you've ever talked to one of my clients, you would know that like, hey, this guy is on the ball. This guy can help you and can do a great job and not irritate you. That's the other thing. Do you really want to, I mean, do you really want to meet people that you don't like? You have the opportunity to know exactly who I am every day of the week as I stream at 9 a.m. in the morning on real estate topics and then real estate news and I commentate on those. I'm a commentator now, I've decided. And then, and then at night at nine o'clock, we talk about employment issues. Now you say, John, you're not an HR person. Nope. Nope. You're not even in a big business. Nope. Nope. So why, what makes you qualified to talk about employment? Well, that's just it. I don't know that anybody's qualified to talk about employment. Okay. Because what I think is happening is things are absurd. We're having a, a situation where things are absurd. Uh, why do people go to work to pee in bottles and poop in bags? Like that isn't work. That's not the way it's supposed to go. Um, why do people have to be on food stamps when they go to these jobs? Like, and you say, well, that's because they didn't go to college. That's because they don't have advanced degrees. That's bullshit. People should be treated like people. Now you say, well, this, this employee is not the best employee ever. Well, maybe they need to find a different place of employment. Maybe, maybe, maybe they don't think that highly of themselves. Maybe they feel like they need to work in these crappy jobs. But then again, maybe it's hard to get a job. Maybe if you don't just go, just absolutely weave your way perfectly through life, you end up in a situation where you're working somewhere where it's not exactly great and you're on food stamps. So you work all day. You know, and how many jobs do we have where, honestly, by the time you drive to work, by the time you put in your time, and by the time you drive back home, you've wasted all of your day. You've spent money on gas and you've made, you've made what, enough money so that you can pay taxes. That's not living. If you can save up money for six months to buy a sandwich out when you're going out to the restaurant with your uh, wife or girlfriend, that isn't, that isn't living. That ain't the way it's supposed to be in the United States. If you're in a job uh, with a major corporation and their goal is to get you to quit within three years so they can bring in somebody new, that ain't working. That's not advancement. That's not moving up the company ladder. So anyway, that's where I'm at on that. I'm, I'm sorry I digress because we are on the real estate channel and that's what we're going to talk about today amongst other things because quite frankly, talking about real estate all day, all the time can be kind of boring. It can be kind of boring. And no matter how much spice I bring to it, it's still terrible. Like we're going to go through articles. Yesterday's greatest article was how to clean your kitchen. Now, did you really need, I mean, it's bad enough to try to read the blog, but do you really want to see someone talk about it? Well, you're in the right place. Now, some of this, some of this is heavy sarcasm. Some of this is, you may not pick up on that at first. Uh, some of this, some of this is my own humor, which is a little bit off. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. And some of my humor doesn't work with people and that's fine. It's fine. But for some of you out there, you should be having a fantastic time 
with the content. You should be uh, enjoying it. You should be telling your friends. You should be doing all the things you need to do to help me get more than 61 subscribers where I'm at now. I really think I should be at about, mm, what, 100? 100? That'd be good. We haven't even talked about, you know, super chats and whatnot. I, I'd be fascinated. I'd be fascinated to see if I could ever get a super chat. Well, I can't get a super chat now because I don't have a thousand subscribers. But if I could ever get a super chat on a live stream about real estate, that would, that would turn the real estate marketing world on its head. And I, I would just think that would be fantastic. Uh, I really would. I think that would be fantastic. You know, you say, John, uh, you're a millionaire real estate agent. Why do you need to, uh, why do you need to do live streams and whatnot? I'm not a millionaire real estate agent. I think you've confused me with someone else. Uh, I, I have, I have buyers that leave. I have buyers that decide never to buy. I have sellers that, uh, that, uh, that don't appear. Uh, all kinds of things happen to me in the real estate world that are terrible. Uh, and it's not because of me. It's not, I'm not, I'm not in denial. I'm just saying, man, it's tough when you, when you work in a people business and people are, uh, they're not perfect. We are, none of us are perfect. And boy, does that show sometimes in the real estate market. God, what a, what a world we live in. Uh, now you say, John, why do you do this? Why do you subject yourself to this, this, this space where people think you're a millionaire and, uh, Yet it's terrible. Like it's hard and, and it's hard on you. Well, I don't know why. Well, no, I do know why. It's because it's like a drug. When you help someone find a house to buy, it's one of the most uh, wonderful moments of someone's life. Okay. Like when you actually get the house under contract and you've been out there looking and looking and looking and finally someone's found the house of their dreams and they're happy and you're, you share in a part of that. It's like a drug. It makes you happy. When you sell a house, okay, that that check when it comes to you, that feels good. That feels good. That's why I do it. Now, uh, is it the most technical work? No, no, but I'm not a very technical person anyway. Um, is it, you know, originally the reason why I wanted to do it is because I didn't want to sit in an office all day. I just didn't want to sit in an office all day. I, I, I couldn't picture myself. I'm just sitting in an office uh, and, and just, you know, filing paperwork and sending emails left and right. Now, ironically, I spend a lot of time in the office now, but it's not, it's not bad. Sometimes I get out pretty much daily. And so I think where we should go now, I'm pivoting. Um, I'm starting to add chapters to my live streams afterwards, as well as a different thumbnail every day, because apparently no one likes the same thumbnail for the last mm, 200 episodes. That's bad. So anyway, now we're transitioning. It's 12, it's 12 minutes and 57 seconds in. I'm giving myself a verbal cue for where to put the chapter. But let's talk about, let's talk about our home showings yesterday. I showed a lot of houses yesterday. Now, if you watch the show on Friday, you would be like, weren't you going to show a lot of ho shows on Saturday? And then if you didn't watch the show on Saturday, you wouldn't know that, yeah, everybody bailed on Friday. I had, I had a whole afternoon of showings set up and everyone bailed. Now, why? Well, the one people, they were busy. And you say, well, that's stupid. They're, they should go buy a house. Well, no, you don't, we don't criticize people for uh, that type of thing. And then the other buyer got cold feet, decided that, the, where, that where we were looking was not where they wanted to be. And so they're like, no, let's just not do this. Why are we wasting time? Uh, how did that help me? Well, it didn't. It didn't because my whole day got thrown for a loop. Um, it, it, didn't, it didn't go well. It didn't go well, but let's go into our showings. Um, why do we do this? Well, we talk about our showings so that we could perhaps glean some sort of uh, information that might be useful in the future to you if you are a buyer or a seller. Um, on the buyer side, what we see in a house, what we're looking for in a house, and then on the seller side, you know, what are the things that buyers don't like? What are the things that buyers do like? How would we stage a house? How would we do this so that people would be very happy? And we're just gonna go through it. So the first house. The first house was a huge house. It was 2,400 square feet. And the biggest problem with this home, quite frankly, was it was dated. It was dated. It was built, okay, in 1970, and they never did anything to the house, ever. Like, it just stayed built in 1970. It was like a time capsule. Nothing was done to the house. Now, now maybe you think that's unheard. If you're 20 years old, okay, the idea that you would buy a brand new house in 1970 
and never do anything to it until 2022. Well, you didn't ever do anything to it in the end because you literally died in the house. Now, what you won't notice is things change around you, okay, but you still feel the same. It works this way in my own life. I think I'm a 22-year-old, okay? But when I get out of bed in the morning and I, I can hardly move my arm and there's some pain in my back for no reason that wasn't there the day before, I realize quickly that I am not 22, okay? I realize, I realize when I'm trying to do a live stream and it gets to be 11 o'clock at night and I'm ready to fall over and just go to sleep, that's when, that's when kids start going out in their 20s. That's when they start leaving the house for the parties. I, I can't even get to that point. So um, that's what happens. The world changes around you. And you know what? At some point you feel good about the fact that your house reminds you of a, of a good time. Obviously, when you buy a house, it's wonderful. So what are some things that date houses? Maybe that's a question we should ask. Well, one, when you walk inside and you see a parquet floor, haven't done parquet floors in quite some time. Uh, then when you go to the left and there's the formal living room and there's the white carpet, sadly, that white carpet is probably actually not, well, I say the tan carpet. I should have said the tan carpet. Sadly, that should be a white carpet, but the time and the dirt has caused it to be a tan carpet. Uh, you go to the kitchen. It's a galley style kitchen. Uh, the cabinets have pulls. All the cabinets and, and drawers have pulls. And the, uh, the stove is that old school circle thing. Now, what did this have, house have in the 1970s that houses even today sometimes don't have? It had an upstairs laundry. When you came off the garage, there was a laundry room, and I think that is fantastic. I think every home should have one. Um, it's, they're not going to. They're not going to, but, I mean, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to have. So then, what, what, besides being dated, what was wrong with this house? Well, it was wrong for my buyer. And you say, well, John, that doesn't make any sense. Why would your buyer go to a house uh, and then it not be right for them? Like, why would they waste their time? Well, they saw the pictures online and they, and they really thought that there might be a chance that they would like this home. Now, when we went in the backyard, the backyard was close to a school. So, uh, meaning it was like literally right next to the school. It was good and bad. The lot size was small. My particular buyer is looking to put a pool in there backyard at some point in time. So that would not work. The second thing is, is the track was good in the sense like, hey, if I want to walk around the track at night, it's right there. It's bad in that, hey, there's going to be football games and basketball games and people are going to be running around uh, like idiots in my neighborhood. Both, both are true. Both are valid. And so the reason why it didn't work for my buyer is my buyer doesn't need that much space literally doesn't need that much space, more room than they would ever know what to do with. Okay. That was the, that was it. That was the end of the house. It w wasn't that somebody uh, did anything bad. Okay. That house is going to sell hopefully. Now we go on to the next house because we, we went to four houses in a row. The next house, she had found that on Zillow. I was like, mm, okay. Now, I don't criticize Zillow too much except for just to let you know, once they became brokers and once they decided that they were going to do investment properties, I, uh, I'm done with them. Um, that, was my, that was my turning point. Um, but, you know, you're welcome to uh, enjoy Zillow as much as you want to. We, we do Realtor.com here, and I don't know that it's, you know, they haven't, at least they haven't tried to become real estate agents. That's all I can say. So this home... When you look at the pictures online, you, you, you think you're at a different house. Because when you show up, um, for instance, what they did, fascinating, they, they, wet, they put water on the driveway and they put water on the walkway in the picture. So it's very shiny and beautiful. Then when you go see it in real life, it looks like garbage. Okay, so you walk in the front door. Uh, at least we could get in the door there. I was having lock problems Friday night. I just could not get into... Was it Friday or Saturday? I don't know. They all mixed together. Anyway, there, I, there was one day I, I just couldn't get in the house. It was weird. So anyway, walk in. Um, we're the only ones there for right now. We uh, go to the upstairs. We walk through. The first room's a living room. The second room is like the kitchen, the, the dining room. And then the kitchen is off to the right, which is also where the basement is. Uh, so then there's a nice three seasons room. And then there's a beautiful backyard. 
Now, what was wrong with this house? It was small. So we got the Goldilocks problem, kind of. We got one house that's too big, and we got one house that's too small. Uh, then when we went into the, into the there's one bathroom, uh, one decent bathroom. And when we went in the bathroom, uh, the shower was somehow they, they added this surround to a traditional steel tub, and it didn't work. And then they put a glass door on it. So, like, you can't move. I mean, the shower is very narrow. And my buyer and I are not narrow people. And so, like, the, the main bathroom in the house now doesn't work. Uh, the two bedrooms were small upstairs. Um, when we went to the basement, it was uh, what we would call a partially finished basement. Uh, there was, like, a little, a little area to hang out in on the right. But one of the no-nos that I have, um, and I'm just putting out there, like, look, you may think that carpet's a good idea in the basement. Okay. You may think it's luxurious. You may think it's a great point. It's not. Don't do it. Don't do it. You may say, well, it's so much cheaper than, no, just stop. Just stop. Well, why, John? Why? Well, something about moisture and carpet don't mix, and especially over time. And uh, you end up with this terrible smell. But anyway, let's, let's continue. So uh, where the system's decent. Now, this is something that I think is highly overlooked. If you could buy a house where the systems, let's say there were two houses. One house, the water heater, the furnace, the roof were all replaced within the past three years. On another house, on another house, the uh, s systems were not replaced, okay? And you needed a new roof, okay? But they came to the market at the same price. Well, why is that? And then how, how do we, how do we, ex how do we, you know, come to a, a decision? Well, you pick the house with the newest systems, okay? And you say, well, why? Well, you pick the house with the newest systems because that's a cost that you don't have to incur within the first few years of ownership, or you shouldn't have to. Whereas that other house that you buy for the same exact price is going to cost you money over time in the short term, because I guarantee you the first week you move in there, the air conditioner is going to blow. And then you say to me, John, that doesn't matter because we have seller, we have a home seller warranty. Yeah. Good luck with that. Good luck with that. If you have an injured air conditioner, they're going to come and fix it, okay? And it's going to last for maybe a season. And then it's going to go out again, and you're not going to be under warranty. So the idea that you buy a house because it has a home warranty is stupid. Absolutely stupid. Now, the fact that they give you a home warranty is a nice thing. Nice thing. But you're, you know, you're essentially paying for it. So we're looking for houses with good systems. Or if we're buying a house... And we know we're going to have to make repairs to these systems. That's okay, too. But what we don't want is buyers to be blindsided by something because our agent didn't mention it. Meaning, like, hey, did you notice that the systems were new? Or, so we always look at the systems. And <clears throat> over time, there's been changes. Like, if you need a new furnace, like, you can't just put in a furnace without putting in a new A-coil. You can't put in a new air conditioner unit without putting in a new A-coil because they've changed the Freon. Okay, so you're getting new stuff, whether or not you like it. You may have a friend in the business. I don't care. My point is simply, look, if you have two houses and you like both of them, one has new systems, the other one doesn't, pick the one with the new systems every single time. And then if you ask me, John, why is it? Why is it that uh, no one pays attention to the systems? Well, it's, it's funny. No one takes pictures of the systems in houses. <clears throat> so real estate agents don't know that systems are different in each house. I mean, they don't know. Like, when they're doing a comparable sale, they can't tell you if the furnace was new in a house that, that you're getting come from. So you're toast there. You have no chance of getting uh, new systems there. So you just literally have to look. Uh, nine times out of 10, your agent's not gonna show you the systems or care. Do you know why? Because they don't care. They just want you to write a contract. Just write a contract and be done with it, okay? Let the home inspector tell you that the systems are crap. Okay, push that off on someone else. I'm just not like that. If I can, if I can, if I can keep you from having to go through the emotional ups and downs of buying an inspection and then withdrawing a contract and moving on to a different property, um, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. I'm going to try and save you money every way and save you time and save you heartache every single chance I get. So anyway, this house, crappy systems. Um, this house, honestly, honestly. We went from a $300,000 house to a $200,000 house. Going to be underwhelming. Going to be underwhelming. So 
That was a no. Now, when we were in there, there were people that came in. So now there's one group of people come through. There was another group of four people that came in. And now we're literally in a 1,000 square foot house. And then as we were leaving, there was another group coming in. Now, when it gets that busy, you can't really look very well anyway. So that, that pretty much just ended it. Ended it. Moving on to the next house. The next house, you know you're in trouble when you take a picture of the house and you don't take a full front picture of the house. You take a picture of, say, perhaps the door. That literally means that the house is going to be ugly. Just been my experience. Uh, what this house wasn't showing hilariously is the massive tree that is literally sitting on top of your sewer pipes. And you may say, well, John, uh, they'll replace the sewer line. And everything will work great. Good luck with that. Just good luck with it. I'm not, it's not a criticism. Just good luck. Good luck. Uh, this, the, this tree was massive. Um, it was going to be a terrible thing. Now, this was an open house. Now, another thing, wonderfully, open houses are absolutely not wonderful. Unless you get a certain amount of people in there, like, it has to be steady. Like, as an agent, you want it steady, but you don't want it jam-packed. Because when it gets jam-packed, everyone just gets, they just want to get out of there. And, of course, this house was that. This house was a fix and flip, okay? And the fix and flip happened because the basement was broken. There were piers used. There was a Kevlar uh, sheets used on the walls to try and keep them from buckling. I mean, this basement was a disaster. Now, did anybody know that? No, because they don't read the disclosures. And if you're looking at Zillow, there are no disclosures. So you have no idea what you're looking at. You just see a pretty house online and you go look at it and you're like, we should buy this. Stupid. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come and hang out with me and learn. Learn what you should be looking for in these houses. There's more to it than price. So anyway, we go in there. And there's a million people, and it's, it's terrible. There's a, uh, w one of the funny things in this house was when you, there's, an, there's a door to the attic. The attic is unfinished, and it's just terrible up there. There's no point in going up there. But they use that as like a selling point. They're like, oh, look at the space you could expand in the attic. It's like, I don't, I don't want to do that. And then anyway, you go to the kitchen, it's fine. You go to the basement, carpet on the basement floor, which is terrible. And the, there's like a main room that's filled. And there's a fireplace on the wall. Um, you can't see the walls. Terrible idea. Then there's a bathroom, okay? Um, and then, so I went with my buyers. We went in the utility sides because I like to look at the systems. And go figure, when we looked inside there, that's where you could see evidence of the disaster that is the basement wall. If you think, like, here's, here's I'm in St. Louis. Here's the deal. If, you're, if your basement walls are trash, okay, and you, and you know this, and you've, do you really think they're ever going to get repaired? Do you ever think that, you know, all the repair, and they say, well, you got a lifetime guaranteed, and we spent like 40 grand. Yes, I get that. But do you really think that that wall is, is going to stay where it's supposed to stay? It's going gonna, it's gonna to break. It's going to be a mess, and it's going to cost you a bunch of money versus just going buying a house that doesn't have those issues. That's the thing. I mean, it's like, you know, like, think of something, think of anything you want. To. Let's just think like, hey, um, I'm going to go to this event, okay? I've bought a suit, okay? Or I rent a suit, okay? Now, it's easier if I bought a suit as long as I didn't gain a bunch of weight. I can just go. And then when I get done, I, but if I, if I have to rent the suit, then I have to go there. I have to pick it up. I have to take it back. It's just more trouble. Now, how much trouble do you want in a house? It's the same thing. You know, you buy the house that doesn't have a screwed up basement to begin with. Now you don't have any problems. Really? What is your problem? You know, you get to spend money on things that you like, like gardening, you know, improving the property in different ways. Not, not spending time. No one cares about your basement repair. It's literally, you spend 40 grand on a basement repair that no one cares about. And it does nothing to the beauty of your home. In fact, it's pretty disgusting what they have to do. Um, they have to dig and it's dirty and it's nasty. Why do you want to put yourself through that at any price? Like, do you just hate yourself? You just want to be miserable? And so, you know, that's, that's my idea. I, I just think it's some. So anyway, uh, that house was a no. That house was just an absolute no. Let's go to the next house. The next house was in a different part of town. They were asking $275,000 for a house that had not been uh, had not been remodeled since 1968. 
What they did, be, what was very curious is someone had ripped the storm door off of the front of the house. Okay, that was odd. What someone had to, was, and this is common, is real estate agents will tell their, their sellers, hey, just rip the carpet out of the house. Just get rid of it. And let's show the hardwood floors underneath. So that was done. So it showed that all, all it did was show that all the hardwood floors needed to be redone. That didn't really do a whole lot. It was a huge house. Everything had to be remodeled. Everything. And now you say, well, John, what, if you, what would the price be if you, if you didn't have to remodel it? And I'm looking now. It would be about what it's, it would sell for about what you have in it right now. That's, that's just, it. that's just the issue. It's like, look, you've just priced it at the top of the market and it's crap and somebody will buy it, but it's just ridiculous. So you go to the basement and there's all this water damage into the carpet. So it smells nasty. It's a terrible thing. That was the last house with those buyers. We didn't write an offer. Would you write an offer on any of those houses that I just showed you or that I just talked about? Nope. All right, let's go on. Uh, later that evening, I went up to a different part of town. We started at a house where the, it was, what is today, Sunday? The offers were due last night at 8 o'clock, and we were showing the house at 6 o'clock. Now you say, John, that's dumb. That's a waste of time. Well, it's not really a waste of time if you're trying to get a feel for the neighborhood. And I wanted this, I wanted this buyer to see this neighborhood because I thought, I thought that his family would do very well there. I thought that would be a good place for him and his family. And I, and I didn't think that it was a spot where he'd been to previous. So we went to this house. I didn't tell him about the contract uh, time being two hours late because what, diff what, what does it matter? Uh, of the 10 houses I show, they probably aren't going to write a contract on any of them. You know, maybe on 20 houses, you get one contract. So it doesn't really matter up front. So we went to the house and, uh, Two car garage, and as I think about it now, I don't remember if we could get into the garage from the from the house. I don't remember, but I hate that. Anyway, um, go in. I'm kind of drawing a blank because of the way the house is. Okay, I got it now. So you go in. There's a room. Then there's another like a larger room that should have been like a formal dining room, but isn't because no one uses a formal dining room anymore. Then there's a big addition in the back. Wonderful. Uh, go outside, and this is where the issue is. The house had been under contract, and it fell out of contract because the deck was a disaster. Now, I don't know how you couldn't tell that the deck was a disaster. You look at it, and it's rotten, and there's, like, no sideboards or edge boards, and uh, it's just going to have to be replaced entirely. It's a mess. And then what it was was there used to be a uh, above-ground pool. They pulled the pool and just kind of left the landscaping and everything, so the backyard's trash. Now, the thing that more that concerned me more than anything is when you looked into the backyard of the neighbor, they were hoarders. And they were they had hoarded so badly that the backyard was starting to fill up with stuff. Now we're in a residential neighborhood, not a poor place by any stretch of the imagination, but that isn't gonna fly. You say, Well, John, what happens if your neighbor becomes a hoarder after you've been in there? That that happens. That's this that's the back that's the breaks. It sucks. I'm sorry, but it, it happened. But you shouldn't actively go and move in someplace where the person behind you is an absolute hoarder. It's just going to cause problems in the future. But anyway, we go. The upstairs is nice. Uh, the kitchen's okay. We go to the basement. The basement is an issue because it smells like cat pee. You say, well, that's not a good smell. No. No, it burns, burns the nostrils. Other than, like, the big thing about this house at the end of the day was it was a rental and the people didn't take care of the house. They let their animals run all over the place and the animals destroyed the house. The house was beat up, it was well used. And it was going to take a lot of money to get the house to a, a, a clean state. You know, like when you have the dogs that, that tear the doors apart by their scratching, you need a new door. You can't just repair that. I mean, it's just gonna have to be done. Uh, and why should you pay for that? You know, why should you pay for that when you could buy another house for the same price somewhere else? So anyway, that was a no. That's a no. So do you see how it didn't matter? It didn't matter that the contracts were due by eight because we weren't putting one in anyway. We were just learning. Next house. This was in, this was in the same part of town, same neighborhood. 
Um, asking price a hundred or twenty five thousand dollars less. And now most of you will say in your in your thinking, well, if a house is being valued at twenty five thousand dollars less, it's probably a terrible house compared to the one you just saw. You'd be wrong. You'd be wrong. Walk in this house, nice little front area. Uh, go off to the the basement. It's got it's not finished all the way, um, and there's some weird things about it. But the but it's a solid basement. By solid, I mean there's not a lot of basement repairs. You can see the walls, and it doesn't smell like cat piss. So then we went outside after that, and there was this monstrous tree in the backyard. Like, I mean, it was so wide. <clears throat> it was as wide as a car. That tree is going to have to come out. Uh, the yard was trash because they had a dog, and it was a big dog. And it gets muddy, and the dog just destroys the yard. That's My dog's doing the same thing in my yard, and everybody seems to be happy about it. So whatever. Um, we... So the yard's not a problem, though. It's a, it's a good size. you got a tree that you're going to have to take down at some point. You go in the house. We're looking around. It's a great house. It's a three-bedroom, two-bath. We see all three bedrooms. Then we see a barn door, and we slide the barn door over. They had taken it, and in a closet, they had built a toilet and a sink in a closet. It was weird. It was weird, and I, and I wanted to like the house. I wanted to have two bathrooms, but that was weird. It was weird, and I, I'm not, I, my, my buyer was just like, no. Like, there's nothing I could have said at that point that my buyer was going to say, yes, this is the house we need. Like, he was just no, immediately no. It shut it down. It didn't, at that point, it didn't matter the price. It was just no. So, let's go to the last one here. Last house. Uh, got a carport. Uh, across the street, there's a boat, a pontoon boat, like 12 cars. And then next door to that one, there's like 12 cars. And then next door to that house, there's like 12 cars. Not a good sign. Not a good, we're not in a neighborhood where these people should be rolling in cash, like where they have just multiple cars, unless um, it's just kind of, yeah. But anyway, uh, asking $1,000 less, three bedrooms, two baths. Uh, go to the basement first. Basement is odd because they tried to add some rooms, but they're very bad at construction and so none of the seams matched up so you just have to tear everything down you just have to tear it all out it's not it's not going to work uh the backyard was okay um they had, there was a deck at one point in time they tore it out and now there's this um like pad of pavers but they didn't have the proper tools and it was just kind of like wavy and dangerous there's a monstrous rottweiler two houses down that would jump up in the air and could literally almost clear the fence jumping straight up. I mean, that was impressive. It was almost, it was like a bear. It was just a huge thing just jumping up. And I really, I wasn't worried about it coming at me because it was too, too over, but man, it was, it was something. Um, the backyard, there's people that live above you and like they can just look down on you the whole time and all the water kind of goes into your property. Not great, but the basement was in great shape, great shape. And then uh, on the upstairs, the bedrooms were small, but they were okay. They were okay. The house was okay. I thought it was a good house. I thought we should put an offer on it. I haven't heard back from my buyer yet. I don't know if we're going to. The offers aren't due until tomorrow. Um, but I would have definitely taken a shot at that house. I think that would have been nice. Would have worked out real well. So that's my showings. Let's get on to other things. 38 minutes in. Google search trends. Let's get to it. Now, we've talked about Cody Rhodes before. And uh, because of that, I thought we should be. Um, now, I said at the time, and I, I'm not going to I'm not going to uh, to gloat, but Cody Rhodes left the AEW and I was like, he's going to the WWE. And then then the, he didn't go. Then he didn't go. And so I was like, really? And they're like, yeah, he didn't he didn't go. And then I didn't pay any more attention about it because I don't watch wrestling. I mean, I didn't even know. Apparently, it was WrestleMania last night. So let's go to it. WrestleMania 38, Cody Rhodes returns to WWE triumphantly as ex-AEW vice president beats Seth Rollins. It says, Rhodes is the first AEW star to show up in the WWE after leaving the company. It says, Cody Rhodes has crossed back in line to the WWE. The former AEW vice president 
and founding member of that company made it good on a significant speculation, appearing on night one of WrestleMania 38 as the opponent of Vince McMahon's choosing against Seth Rollins. Now, I don't know. I don't know a lot about this. But it says Rhodes, who recently left his position as executive vice president and performer for AEW, received a raucous ovation from those in attendance at AT AT&T Stadium in Arlington, Texas on Saturday. Now, I don't know if they filled up the stadium there, but if they did, my gosh. He was welcomed with a pyro celebration in the ring, up the entrance ramp, and on the stage before his signature music played, and he returned to WWE for the first time since 2016. To me, that doesn't seem that long ago. But, you know, hey, a major storyline heading into night one of WrestleMania 38. So is there more than one night of WrestleMania this year? I mean, that's pretty impressive. Involved a mystery opponent for Rollins chosen by McMahon, the WWE chairman. Rhodes made his triumphant return using the same theme music and elaborate entrance he utilized in AEW. I'm not going to watch it. Don't care. Rollins, or Rhodes and Rollins submitted an exciting physical contest that will contend for match of the night. The American Nightmare wore the brunt of the damage with a visible swelling on his forehead and plenty of redness around his body. Early in the contest, Rhodes briefly exhibited Stardust's mannerisms, a figurative shredding of the skin of Rhodes' much maligned gimmick prior to his WWE departure. Now, let's go back and read that because it didn't make any sense to me. Early in the contest, Rhodes briefly exhibited Stardust's mannerisms, a figurative shredding of the skin of Rhodes's much maligned gimmick prior to his WWE entrance. Okay. Okay. We got some tweets. It says, uh, the finishing sequence saw Rhodes land his finishing move crossroads twice. So he had to plan his name. He subsequently delivered the bionic elbow in memory of his late father, the American dream, Dusty Rhodes. Oh, I didn't know he was, I didn't know he had passed. Oh, well, one last cross road. One, wow, As he's used two finishing moves here. Kept off the former AEW star's WWE return. Okay, well, this is, I mean, this is compelling. I don't know. I don't know if you know, if you can even turn this off. Rhodes exited WWE in 2016 following a decade in which the company's system, oh, in the company's system, Burdened by a comedic face-painted gimmick called Stardust, Rhodes first reinvented himself as a major player on the independent scene. Working with Kenny, Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks, Rhodes became a member of the infamous Bullet Club. See, now, infamous would lead you to think that that meant you were famous, but I don't know anything about it. He was then a foundational element in the eventual loss of Tony Khan's AEW. While a number of notable WWE veterans, including Adam Cole, who's that? Brian Danielson, Chris Jericho, CM Punk, Jeff Hardy, and John Moxley have made the jump to AEW. But this marks the first time an AEW alum has signed with WWE. And that is a big deal. Rhodes is a two time Intercontinental Champion, six time tag, tag team champion at the time of his original WWE departure. He returns with more titles on his resume, including AEW's TNT Strap, the NWA World Heavyweight Championship, the IWGP United States Championship, and the ROH World Championship as title reigns under his belt. Well, that's... Now, look. Now, I know you come here. They said that was a two-minute read. It seemed like it was like six hours. I know you come here for your wrestling content on the real estate channel. So congratulations to all of you who have made it through that. Let's look at homes in Houston. I don't know if I've seen these. Okay. Houston's a big place. I think it's like the fourth largest city in the United States. Okay. And now I'm, I'm actually literally getting rid of email while we're talking. All right. Let's look at the first house. Let's see if it comes up. Okay. It did now. Oh, did they? I hate this. The MLS in Houston sucks. Let's take a look at 606 days on the market built in 2003. It's going to be like this. I hate it. You probably my my but you, look, my picture is right on the screen. It looks terrible, but let's just go through it the best we can cuz I don't have time to change anything else. Here we go. Beautiful first picture, beautiful second picture, beautiful third picture. That's a little weird. Um look at that though. The little moss covers that. That's that's by design. There's the inside. Look at that. 
I mean, we're just going through it. That's for old people. Um, that's all I can say about that. And here, don't move this. Don't move this before the shoot because you can see the lines. I'm just trying to help. There's your theater room. That looks nice. I mean, there's an ad, which isn't helpful. Um, where's the description? Do we have one? I mean, it's just crap. I hate this. They only do this for Texas, too. Who thinks this is a good idea? Here, is this going to work? No. Look at this. It's just terrible. All right, so that's picture number, that's just number one. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this because it's so bad. Like, who really wants to see pictures like this? It's just bad. 27.5 million, five bedrooms, five and a half on a 12,000, it's a 12,000 square foot house, four car garage. I mean, look at this. It doesn't even, it doesn't scroll well. It's just. I just, I hate this. Why do they do this? That's pretty. I think that's an elevator too, but I can't, I can't guarantee it. Oh my God. No, I'm not going to give you feedback. You know, here's the feedback. This sucks. There. Hmm. That's interesting. I don't even remember the kitchen in the other one because I was just trying to get out of it. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful house. Now, twenty-seven million is is quite a bit of money. I don't have twenty-seven million. Okay, I wouldn't even know what to do with that. But hey, it's a beautiful home, and I'm out because I hate this. I hate this setup. Don't make me go. Don't make me go to. Uh, oh gosh, is this a, just a disaster day? Okay, here we go. Last one: seventeen point nine million. Still going to be the same crappy thing. 298 days on the market, built in 1986. Interesting look. Kind of like, hey, look, here's the roof in the second picture, because that's really what we care about. That is bizarre. That's the backyard, I believe. There you go. Now, there's your floor. It's beautiful. The only thing on a tile floor that beautiful, I'd hate to drop something, you know, and like crack a tile. Like, how do you fix that? I mean, look at that. I'm going kind of, there's the kitchen. I think it's nice. I mean, I, it's a nice place, right? These pictures are killing me. Look at that stove setup. Two ovens. One, two, three, three burners. Those are warming ovens. I don't see a microwave, but I mean, that is just impressive. That kitchen is fat, as they would have said, like, you know, in the day. Look at that. Is this the bathroom? Hmm. Is it, that's not the elevator. I, I really, look at that chandelier. That's in a house. I mean, just wonderful. I really don't know what I'd pick between all these houses, to be honest. Like, which one do you go with? Look at that. Now, I don't see, and I'm not trying to be critical, but I don't see the outdoor space. This house was built in 1986. The outdoor living stuff, I mean, that's beautiful. But, I mean, it's still not like there's this, I mean, it's, it's nice, but it's not kind of where, like, that's what I'm talking about. More of this outdoor space where you can watch TV, a fireplace. I mean, this is, this is nice. It has the outdoor space. This is the roof. Anyway, I don't know. I I don't know how many pictures we just looked through because I just hate this look. Anyway, Houston, Texas has some nice houses. It's hard with the it's hard with the way they're set up in this system. Don't like it. All right, let's get to our articles. Demand for vacation homes drops to the lowest level in nearly two years. Well, what is this about? What is this about? You mean we can't buy a vacation home anymore? says, this is by Redfin. Redfin does the best data for marketing, I think, any company does. You wonder why, like, why doesn't Keller Williams do this? Why doesn't, uh, why doesn't any of the Rheology brands do this? I mean, this is easy stuff. This is easy marketing, and you 
you can you can get so much bang for the buck out of this. I, I get stuck reading pretty much every single Redfin report, okay? Are they true? Sure. Uh, according to Redfin, they are. Um, it's just great data, and it's just they're, they're just eating your lunch. Now you say, John, why don't you do this? Well, I mean, let's be honest. It's me and Jan. I mean, and, I, mean I'm, I don't see how I could do these reports like this. But if I ever did, you know, I know I'd get, I used to, I used to, I used to do press releases. I just don't have this. I just don't have the ability to do all that and, and do everything I'm doing. Like I'm literally out of time. It's bad. Anyway, the vacation home boom started fading in February, partly because of rising mortgage rates. Still demand for second homes is 35% above pre pandemic levels. Demand for vacation homes dropped sharply in February with mortgage rate locks for the second homes reaching their lowest level since May 2020. Demand was still up 35% from pre-pandemic levels, but that's significantly low than the 87% increase the month before. February also marked the first month since the start of the pandemic that growth in demand for primary residents outpaced that of vacation homes, albeit only slightly with mortgage rate locks for primary homes up 36% from pre-pandemic levels. Now, what you don't know is if you go to a, a lender and you say, I want to buy a second home, that's a different classification than a first time, you know, a first home or a primary home. And your interest will be slightly different for the most part. Now you can get around that. I think, I think I haven't talked to my lender about this. Uh, so I don't remember for sure. I think that's what I, he told me, but this was a while back. But let me, let me posit this, um, this hypothesis. My belief is that people may have bought vacation homes, uh, Two different ways. One, they bought as a vacation home because they, they were thinking about leaving the cities. You know, they were thinking about, you know, being in a place where there was less craziness that's going on. Um, that was one reason. And number two, these were people that had money that um, during the, the, the heavy days of the pandemic really didn't like where they were living. They thought that they could do it better and they wanted to try something out. So rather than sell their home outright, they bought a second home and they moved to that home to see what they thought about it. See if this type of living was going to suit them. Um, and because a lot of people could now for the first time work from anywhere in the world, they thought that maybe, you know, maybe we should go to a, a vacation area, a, you know, a more remote area than we would normally have lived in because of our jobs. Now we can go and we can enjoy our lives there um, all the time, 365 days a year. So that's my belief. Can I prove it? No. No. It says demand for second homes soar start soaring in mid 2020 as the pandemic took hold, reaching a peak in March of 2021 with demand up 95 percent from pre pandemic levels. The combination of remote work, record low mortgage rates and a desire to get away from crowds motivated many affluent Americans to buy vacation homes. But last month, demand fell sharply from the month before as mortgage rates rose. I don't believe that this is the same thing. OK, I don't believe that the. Uh, the second home demand is related so much to the mortgage rates as it is to the change of life uh, desires that many of these people had during the virus. Uh, rising mortgage rates combined with rising home prices are hitting the second home market much harder than the primary home market. I don't believe that. That's largely because vacation homes are optional. People don't need second homes, but they do need a place to live. Still, people are buying up vacation homes more than they were before the pandemic as work remains more flexible than it used to be. Again, my own opinion, I don't think, I, I think the reason why it's slowing down is because there's either the people that are moving to these second homes have already moved or um, they're just not, it's just not like, it's just that the, 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 the people aren't moving there anymore. They don't, the, the, the draw isn't there. The average 30 year mortgage rate reached a peak of 3.92% in mid February. Substantially higher than the 2.65% low in the beginning of 2021. The typical monthly mortgage is up hundreds of dollars from a year ago, partly as a result of that increase. Demand for second homes may continue to decline in the coming months as loan fees for second homes go up. The FHA announced fees for second home loans will increase by about 1% to 4%. Starting in April, the change will add about $13,500 to the cost of purchasing a $400,000 home for the typical second home buyer, which can be either paid up front or rolled into a mortgage. Now, I don't. I don't think that a thirteen thousand um, dollar fee is going to hurt somebody if they're buying a four hundred thousand dollar second home. 
That's why they're putting it in. Home prices up, supply down in seasonal towns, although mortgage rate locks for second homes were down in February. Prices continued to grow in seasonal towns where vacation homes are often located. Home prices in seasonal towns rose 20% year over year in February to a median of $513,000. February marks more than a year and a half of 10% plus year over year growth for home prices in seasonal towns. That's due partly to a severe shortage of inventory with the number of homes for sale in seasonal towns down a record 29% over year, year over year in February. The fact that home prices are up and inventory is down, even though second home demand is declining, suggests that some workers with permanently remote jobs may be relocating to vest- vacation destinations rather than purchasing second homes and that investors are interested in seasonal towns. This is, I think, true. This is the most likely um, scenario that I, that I feel like uh, is true in this, in this situation. Meanwhile, Home prices in non-seasonal towns were up 13% to 414000 and supply was down 17%. So for this analysis, a seasonal town is defined as an area where more than 30% of housing is used for seasonal or recreational purposes. Huh. Okay. So that's, that's you know, I, again, interest rates being up isn't the reason why vacation homes is dropping, in my opinion. So we'll move on. Four things you can do if an inspection comes back with big ticket fixes. Well, uh, what it depends. It depends. It depends on the buyer. It depends on the seller. Um, but let's look at this article. I thought it was. I thought it was interesting. And I thought we should go over it. So, um, if you think of home buying like riding a roller coaster, the home inspection can often be. Look at that urologist uh, ad in the middle of it. Often be one of those unexpected loops you didn't see coming. Before you reach the closing table, a home inspection gives you, the buyer, a good snapshot of the home's condition. During this process, a professional will examine the physical structure and systems of the house from its foundation to its roof. Ideally, the inspection reveals the maintenance projects and repairs that need attention, whether they're overdue or coming up in the new future. I don't know if that's true, ideally. Ideally, it finds if there's really big issues that you've got to deal with immediately, and if it materially changes the... um, the pricing of the home or would if someone knew that that was the problem. A home inspection is not a guarantee to catch every issue with the home. You can't open walls or sander doors, but it's a good indicator of the home's condition. It gives the buyer an opportunity to decide if they want to proceed and if so, under what conditions. Now, you try this in this market. Go ahead and ask for your 10-day inspection and see how it goes versus someone that buys it as is. No inspections. Good luck. But let's say your offer is accepted and you're managing where your plants will get the best lighting and boom, Home inspection comes back with a monster repair, like a leaky roof or a deck with corroding fasteners. What's a buyer to do? Here's all of your options if you're under contract, and the inspection reveals big problems. Now, just understand, we're not in this market here in St. Louis right now. But anyway, let's get go through it. It says you can request repairs. You can ask the seller to get the items repaired prior to closing by a licensed professional. You may have more luck with this strategy in a buyer's market as opposed to the extreme extreme seller's market we're in right now. In fact, some buyers are opting to waive property inspections altogether in an effort to make their bid shine. A risky move real estate agents aren't keen on. Anyway, that's because we can't negotiate repairs at that point. Another downside with this approach is that contractors are in high demand as nearly 9 out of 10 construction firms says they're having trouble hiring workers. That could mean long waiting lists for getting a new roof or remedying water damage. That's exactly right. You want to close in 30 days and you want them to fix a bunch of stuff? By the way, do you think that they're going to use the best quality contractor that they possibly can to get it fixed, or are they going to use the cheapest contractor to get it fixed? They're going to use the cheapest. They don't care. They're trying to move out of their house. It's not a great idea. Ask for a price reduction in the amount of the repair. I, I like this. I like this, and now watch. This is They disagree with me. Going with this strategy could get you the closing table quicker since you're not waiting for fixes to be made to the home's foundation, but this is the least favorite option of one real estate agent. If you do a price reduction, once you split it over a 30-year mortgage, you'll barely notice the difference. I don't like to, I like to do a price reduction because, anyway, similarly, you could go through the home appraisal, which will consider the major issue uncovered in the inspection, then you can settle on a lower price with the seller. That's not true. That's not true. This is fantasy land. The reason why I like a seller credit is because it's clean, okay? It's just clean. It makes it a lot easier. Look, if it's going to cost me 10000 if we find a reputable contractor and says it's going to cost $10,000 to fix it, and you see the bill, and you know we're not trying to mess with you, give us our credit and move on. Now, that's, that's a change in price, I suspect. I call it a credit, but it's, it's a change in price. 
agree to a different price on the property. That's, that's the way I would do it. That'd be the cleanest way to do it. But, um, you know, in this market, they're not going to do that. They're just going to go back on the market. They're going to disclose that there's a problem and then they're going to go right back on the market and they're going to sell. Request a closing credit in the amount of the repair. You can put closing credits toward your closing costs, helping alleviate fees associated with lenders, attorneys, and title insurance. For example, if your closing costs are $10,000 and you request a $5,000 closing credit, you've now reduced your closing costs by $5,000 and have money put aside for the repair, giving you more control and freedom over a potentially stressful home project. If you can stomach taking on a project after your close, this will give you the chance to vet different contractors and make repairs. I just don't. First of all, you can only get a credit to a certain percentage of the mortgage. I don't remember what it is off. The, I think it's 3%. So if you're asking for a credit more than that, you're in, in deep, deep doo-doo with your mortgage. However, you're, you're better off just getting a change in the price. Now, why do real estate agents don't like that? I'll let you figure it out. But honestly, like on $5,000 on a $300,000 house and I'm, I'm losing a little bit of money, I don't care. I just want my buyer to have a good deal. And I really don't, like the sellers oftentimes don't realize how bad something is. I mean, if you have a tree root underneath a, tr uh, a sewer line with a, tree, a sewer ladder with a tree root underneath it, they don't know. They don't know. And so when you see the camera and it's messed up, they're like, well, we didn't know. I'm sorry. And then you got to take down the tree and, you gotta, and it's just a mess. Your whole front yard's a mess. They, they had no idea. And you know what? They could have had a camera do uh, work, you know, five years previous and it wasn't broken at all. And now it's a disaster. So anyway, that's, that's that. And then get your earnest money back. Depending on how your inspection contingency is written, if the discovery is so massive that it's beyond repair, the repair is simply too large to make it worth what you're paying back for the property, you can back out of the sale and get your deposit back. That's true. That's true. And in ours, you don't even have to, you don't even have to give a reason. <clears throat> On the inspection, if it's not to your liking, you can just walk. You don't even have to give them, you, you, sometimes they don't even want the report back because then they would have to disclose the issue. You're much better off saying, hey, I'm out. And it depends. The seller's going to be mad no matter what. Okay. They're going to be mad no matter what. But, but they also, some of those seller's agents are smart and they know they're like, Okay, like you were leaving for what reason? And you say, well, we're, we don't, we're not, we just had an inspection and we don't have to tell you, we're out. And they're like, thank you. Because if, the, if you say, here's why we're leaving and you give them an inspection report, now they have to disclose this. Now this isn't, this isn't as, as a much of a weapon as you would think. A lot of buyer's agents will come back at you and you're like, if you don't agree to this, you'll have to disclose it and you may not get a sale. And it's like, well... I think most people actually have like a peace of mind when they see an inspection report that fails and they're like, Hey, it's cool. We'll buy it. We're good. So I don't ever worry about that. That's a negotiation tactic by the buyer's agent. And it's one that I don't even use because of the way I just deflected it for you. It's just too easy. It's like flick. Say, well, your seller will be mad that you, no, I don't care. Seller will was, was working with me before and we know, and we talk about these things ahead of the time. So when they do happen, or if they do happen, we know how to respond. That's it. That's the show. Now, look, I've got to show a house this afternoon. I kind of want to, I've got some bushes I'd like to plant. I don't know which to do. I, I literally don't. I don't. It depends on what my wife wants to do. I don't know what to do. Anyway, I got to make a thumbnail. I got to do some other things. But here's what you need to know. Tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., I'm going to be at this same chair, and we're going to talk about real estate. And it's going to be called the Deerwood Realty live stream. All the things that are going on in the real estate world, you're going to hear about it from somebody who's actually in it. And if you really like me, which is fine, I'm, I'm good with that. I like me. I'm, I'm, I'm good with myself. At 9 o'clock tonight, we talk about labor and employment issues in the United States. Now, I'm in the employment arena. I own a business, but I, I can't speak for other businesses as far as like knowing exactly what's going on in their businesses. It's just not something I'm aware of, but I think it's a good, I think it's a good thing to talk about. I think, I think we need to talk about these things. I think we need to get these out in the open. So hopefully we can have some reform both on the, on the employer side and the employee side. Neither side is perfect in this. I do believe that as we go on, uh, we'll find some some things we can maybe agree on. 
So, I don't know if I'll be at 9 o'clock tonight. I have something going on. i got to set up that Twitter so that you know my schedule. Uh, but I'm, I'm planning on, I have everything that I need to start tonight. I just don't know when I'll get to it exactly. So, anyway, with that, I'm going to head out. Thank you for watching. Come on, come on in, subscribe, be a part of the chat someday.